today we're going to be looking at uh, people, places, and the environment. Your essential question for today is dealing with human environment interaction. Uh, the question is how do people affect the environment and then how does the environment affect people? We're going to be looking at those two terms or those two different ideas today in this lesson. Uh, first thing that we're going to look at is what's called adaptation versus modification. Uh, there's a difference there. If we're talking about modification, that means that we are actually changing the environment. If we're talking about adaptation, that means we're changing the behavior of people. It's important that you understand those two concepts. Modification, I'm actually physically changing the environment. Adaptation is I'm changing myself, my behavior, the way I live um, to adjust to a situation. Here's a couple examples. The first one goes with modification. This is kind of a... a, a visual of what terrace farming looks like. Uh, now in the areas where altitude is steep uh, and you're still wanting to farm, you can't farm very well on something that's sloped really high. So what they do is they cut these terraces into the side of mountains or into the side of hills and you have these flat areas. A lot of times this is where rice is grown. They create these little marshes with these rice paddies where this water can just sit. You're physically changing the layout of the environment in terrace farming, so it is modification. The picture here is I tried to draw an air conditioner. I have an air conditioner unit in the window uh, and it's blowing in this room that would be right here. That would be adaptation because I'm changing the way I live to live in an environment. So if I was going to live in the desert, this would be changing the way I live to make sure that I could live in this type of environment. Also, insulating this house would be an adaptation to the environment because I'm changing my the way I'm living uh, in order to live in, the, in a certain situation. The next main point that we're going to look at are natural hazards. Uh, what I've defined as natural hazards are extreme weather and physical events. And then now we're going to look at how that changes people. The first natural hazard that we're going to look at, number one, is El Nino. Uh, El Nino is a weather pattern that occurs because the sun's uh, direct rays are heating on the equator um, longer and it's creating a warmer ocean temperature. So in the areas around the equator like the Gulf of Mexico, you have evaporation a lot more quickly and so you have a lot of storms and a lot of rains and flooding like it says here uh, in Texas uh, because of El Nino. On the flip side, there's drought in Southeast Asia because that evaporation is not occurring as quickly and that evaporation is occurring in uh, this warm water area around Texas. And so all this rain that normally would go to the Southeast Asia, like with the monsoons and things, uh, is now moved towards Texas and, and the American South, basically, uh, and, and the Mexico area. Uh, so El Nino, this weather pattern, kind of affects people in different ways. It creates flooding and it also creates kind of a drought area. Now what I've added to each of these examples at the bottom uh, is I've kind of added some either adaptations or modifications or both if I could think of any. The only adaptation that I could come up with for El Nino is kind of predicting. Uh, meteorologists predicting where this flooding is going to happen or where the drought is going to occur. Um, that's kind of the, the, the best example of adaptation or modification with El Nino. Uh, the next one is kind of a subset of uh, El Nino and that is floods. Floods can create a dispersion of population, meaning people can move because of floods and because of flooding zones. Um, but adaptation versus modification, again, weather prediction would be an adaptation. Modifications would might be creating um, flood walls, uh, areas that normally flood, blocking them in where they don't flood, uh, maybe creating better drainage systems to where the, the flood waters can go somewhere. Um, but still, modifications with floods is, is kind of difficult to come up with. Another example is uh, of a extreme weather pattern is a tsunami. A tsunami is when the plates underneath the ocean surface buckle and this, this sudden buckling creates a big dispersion in the wave and then you have this huge wave. You can see my wave here coming across to this city. Um, this wave will, will reach the coast at some point because of the plate tectonics underneath the ocean surface. You can also have displacement of people. They can move because of this uh, and that can affect the populations of an area. Adaptation is really just prediction and the problem with tsunamis is you could kind of predict when they're coming but it's only in a matter of hours. Uh, generally uh, a few hours under 24 hours do we, we know if a, if a tsunami is coming. Um, but some also some predictions capabilities are like seismographs and things where you're detecting um, this movement underneath the ocean surface. Some modifications, some of these areas have seawalls. Some of these areas have built their cities higher up so that when you have tsunamis, as long as they're not major tsunamis, they won't flood this immediate area. A lot of times what you'll see in the coastal areas is you don't have, the city center is further away than the coast. 
uh, if tsunamis are susceptible in the area. But tsunamis are again some that's hard to modify the environment or even adapt to the environment because predictability is not in a long time in advance. Another example is volcano. You can see my great visual here of a volcano of an extreme weather pattern. Of course, this can make people move. Maybe they don't want to live in a volcano zone. Uh, adaptations are just like predictions, and we're not very good at predicting volcanoes either. You can look at seismographs and those things and see when they might happen, but prediction, prediction capabilities of volcanoes are not the best. Um, and again, I put seismograph here as an adaptation. Modification, it's hard to modify the environment with a volcano. There's really not a lot that you can actually do in that type of situation. I added this section here of, of kind of looking at how natural hazards aren't always totally bad. Um, there's some benefits that can come from natural hazards. For example, with volcanoes, once this does, the, the ash and things, once it does fall, this can be very, very fertile soil and that can improve farming uh, in these areas. Also, you can have land building or island building. Uh, Hawaii is just one big volcano. Hawaii was created by these volcanoes erupting and then that lava hits the ocean and then it creates land, which is pretty fertile soil. So you can have land building with that. Hurricanes, uh, in the wake of hurricanes, it can help agriculture because you have very fertile soil that's then washed up uh, and it's also wet and you've got a lot of rain. Uh, I also added like insurance companies. Uh, econ economically, there's some companies that can benefit from hurricanes. Also flooding. It can increase the water supply. Of course it can also pollute that water supply, uh, but it can increase underwater water supplies uh, with flooding. So there, there are some benefits. It's, all, it's not all bad things from natural hazards. Next thing I want to look at is the relationship between settlements and the environment. Basically we're looking at the relationship between people and the environment and how they are changing that. Uh, what we're going to get to today is uh, the idea of sustainable development and there's two main points off of sustainable development. There's renewable resources and non-renewable resources. What sustainable develop me development means, it's using resources in a way that we're still using them today but we're protecting the amount and supply of those resources for the future. That's a key point you got to understand. It's not the idea of we're just going to totally stop using oil and natural gas and these fossil fuels. Uh, now so that we'll have them in the future. No, it's using them in a way that we will have a constant supply when the time comes. You're sustaining these resources. You're not just totally going away from them. Uh, some examples kind of biofuel, the idea of the green revolution, going green, uh, hydroelectric power, um, using things and resources in moderation, that's a key term. Also conservation, uh, conserving the amounts of these supplies and how we use them. Those are huge with sustainable developments. And then the last two points, renewable resources and non-renewable resources. Renewable resources are just like the term says. They're resources that will renew themselves in a short period of time. Um, not that immediately they'll come back. Sometimes it does, but you're, it's resources that will renew themselves over a short period of time. Some examples that I put is like electricity. You, there aren't ways to uh, renew electricity such as hydroelectricity, hydroelectric power, creating electricity from running water. Um, the most common examples are uh, wind, like the windmills that you see around, um, the windmills that produce electricity, also the windmills that pump water from the ground where you see with livestock, um, and then sun, solar energy, solar power. Um, these are examples of renewable energy because like with the solar panels, they are not taking energy from the sun and the sun is not losing energy. The sun's emitting this energy anyways. The solar panels are just taking that energy and then creating something else from it. Same thing with uh, windmills. Um, it's not like it's just sucking in all the wind and the wind is gone. It's using the wind to power the turbine uh, so that then you can then create electricity off of that. Non-renewable resources are those resources that will not renew themselves over a short period of time. The best example of this um, is when you're looking at the fossil fuels. Oil, natural gas, and coal. Um, these fossil fuels um, that will not renew themselves over a short period of time. It takes thousands or even millions of years to get those up again. And so this is where we've got to be protective of. We've got to use these less and use renewable resources more because we can renew these over a short period of time and it's going to take us not in our lifetime or our kids or their kids or their kids' lifetime before these will renew. So we've got to be very careful with non-renewable resources and we need to shift and move more renewable resources, which you'll see that um, in society uh, now more than ever.